All right, folks, we welcome you back. It's hour number two, and Heather Hansen is here joining me on this hour. Nice to have you aboard. Great to be here. And you've seen her on CNN and on Fox. She is an attorney, and we're happy to have her here in, in, in studio with us for this uh, hour. And uh, I want to focus, Heather, for before we go to uh, Matt Kibbe very quickly, there was testimony today before the Congress uh, by the, uh, the head of, uh, of GM now, Mary uh, Barra, and also the head of the NHTS, uh, Mr. Friedman, or the acting head, uh, they both testified about this uh, this horrific uh, like 13 deaths of uh, Chevy uh, uh, Colts, and um, it turns out, according to some of the, the congressmen who were who were doing the questioning, uh, when GM turned a blind eye to this because of a great expense, it turns out it was a 57 cent piece for 57 cents on each car they could have avoided this whole fiasco the lawyers are just rubbing their hands together at this point steve the only problem is with the bankruptcy there's going to be some question as to whether or not civil litigation people are going to be able to get any money from before the bankruptcy so it's because this is that, that took place before the restructuring and now it's a new right. a new regime a new company so to speak arguably although if all of these hearings bring out the fact that this stuff was hidden before the bankruptcy then there's an argument for the lawyers that they can actually get in there and get some of that yeah, money. And it appears that that was the case. And you know, yeah. it's funny, not funny, very sad. Uh, we have a, a New York Times story here that uh, the Cobalts uh, co were seen as, uh, as lemons from the very start, according to what some of the data shows. And then there's a quote of uh, Barack Obama uh, here at a GM plant in September of 09, uh, touting uh, the, uh, that very vehicle, saying that program was good for automakers, consumers, and our environment. And he about the cash for clunkers, and he said the Chevy Cobalt that you built here was one of GM's most sought-after cars under that program. Dealers across the country started running out of it and needed to build more. And during this whole time, reportedly, GM knew that this was a, uh, a disaster happening and waiting to happen. Well, and it could even open up to criminal liability. You saw Toyota just had that huge settlement with the government because of the Tread Act, and you could see that happening here. All these different hearings are going to open up different questions, and with follow-up, you may see some criminal liability Yeah, as we'll, we'll talk more about that. And then uh, any minute, uh, we're not going to cover it because uh, – I don't want to get sick, but Barack Obama is going to do his victory lap, and he's going to spike the football, and maybe he's going to hit a home run. He, 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 he met with the Boston Red Sox to, to honor them for their World Series victory uh, last year today. So um, saying, we hit $7 million. Now, do you believe they hit $7 million? I don't know about whether they hit $7 million. The thing is, we don't have the data. We don't know who the $7 million are. Were they uninsured before? What are the ages? You know, we'll hear from Matt Kibbe about whether that's important or not. But all of that type of data is what's going to feed into whether this is actually a success. Right. Even if if they did he hit that seven million which is right okay. and, and and there's a, been a lot of talk uh that you know six million people lost their health care insurance in the first place right. and now if they got seven million we blew up the whole health care system to get at this point one million other people signed up or a net gain of one million it doesn't make any sense well that's what it is it's, do we get how many uninsured have actually signed right. up and that's the data that we're going to be waiting for to see whether this you know if he's spiking the ball that's yeah, great but yeah. later on he may be uh, going back some yards we will see i mean he hasn't had much uh, positive news uh created uh true or otherwise to uh to talk about when it comes to obamacare so we shall see um yeah matt kibbe uh president and ceo of uh, freedom works and uh He's written a great new book, and uh, he, he's going to join us momentarily here, and um, a, a libertarian. And uh, I have a little problem with some libertarians, and uh, I'll ask Matt about uh, what seems to be, in my view anyway, their, their main concern of uh, drugs, but we'll get to that. But I want to lead into the interview uh, with the, this uh, video, so everybody watch. But I think in the big picture here, you got to remember where they started. There was real fear inside the White House that this law could collapse, that they wouldn't get here. So at a minimum, the importance of hitting the six million, it means the law is unrepealable, Matt. It means that it's here to stay. So then we've advanced to the next part of the debate is, okay, then how do you fix the problems that people think are? All right, Chuck Todd with the, uh, I guess he's the bearer of bad news as we welcome you back to the Steve Malsberg Show. And Heather and I uh, welcome in our guest, Matt Kibbe, and he is the president and CEO of Freedom Works and the author of a great new book, Don't Hurt People and Don't take their stuff and um, Matt welcome what do you say to, to Chuck Todd because first of all he's way behind the times that was yesterday baby he said six million we're up to seven million tomorrow will be a ten million I don't know what he's talking about but do you believe that uh, it's unrepealable because this is one prime example of uh, what you write about in your book that you don't want to see and neither do I yeah it's funny the the rationale and bending over backwards to justify the implementation of something that doesn't work and it sounds like it's all about them right it, it wasn't about uh, helping people 
who need better health care. It was about getting this thing over the finish line so that they could control our health care. I think their problem is, is, is basically numbers. Young people are going to do the math and they're not going to sign up for this thing. And whether or not they met their first goal, the real challenge is, is forcing everybody into the system. And I don't think people are going to buy it. Okay, well, I, I, I hope you're right because, uh, you know, I, I want Chuck Todd to be proved uh, wrong. But uh, health care and Obamacare is just one of the things that you uh, write about in the book and one of the examples uh, of, uh, you know, of the government actually hurting people and taking our stuff, in this case our doctor and our health plan, uh, possibly and probably, uh, but there's a lot more that you address. Yeah, the, the whole problem with big government progressivism is for all of the promises about helping people, the fact of the matter is there's, there's always a middleman. There's always somebody that's actually benefiting from these big government programs. I think in this case, it's insurance companies that, that cut that deal that forces young people to buy something they don't need. It's obviously government bureaucrats, including the IRS, that's going to get to enforce this, even though they aggressively lobbied to keep themselves out of it. So when, one of the themes in this book is really it's not, it's not Republican versus Democrat, it's them the big government and all of their cronies versus the rest of us, the taxpayers. Matt, I'm wondering whether or not that is going to lead to another party. I know you've mentioned this in past interviews, that you're open to that idea. Are you seeing that as being the future? And if so, what would be the impetus? Well, I think it's, I think it's a lot smarter for people that believe in liberty to repopulate the Republican Party because it's a two-party system. But I think politics generally, both Democrats and Republicans, is it's becoming more democratic more decentralized because of the internet, because of people's ability to find out what's actually going on. And I think that's going to shake up both parties. And you're seeing that in the so-called civil war in the Republican Party right now. Well, of course, there's also a, a civil war in the, uh, in the uh, Democrat Party uh, to an extent. But let's, you know, when I hear libertarian, and I think I've talked about this with you in the past, you know, right away, for better or for worse, for right or for wrong, I think about, okay, the end the war on drugs. Now, is that is that an unfair uh, label or, or or you know preconceived notion uh, that I have uh, uh, of libertarians? Well, I think a lot of people focus on on the difference on social issues like the question of, of decriminalization of drugs. But I would go back and, and quote Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan said that conservatism's heart and soul was libertarianism. And I think you know even back then the word was kind of contrived. Reagan pointed out that we used to all call ourselves liberals, meaning believing in freedom, believing in individual responsibility and the rule of law. And it's that common set of values that brought the Tea Party to life, that brings constitutional conservatives and self-described libertarians together. I figure it was, it was time to start explaining what those values were in, in common sense language. Matt, are you seeing a younger and younger base for your um, committee? I'm kind of with the ACA coming forward, and as you've said, the younger people are seeing that it's not working to their benefit. I'm wondering if that's impacting the numbers of younger people who are looking to um, institutions like yours. Yeah, I mean, the polling shows that, that more and more young people have buyer's remorse with, with Obama and his top-down policies. You saw just uh, a few days ago Rand Paul get a standing ovation at Berkeley. Something's going on. I think they're understanding that too much government power in the hands of, of faceless, gray-suited bureaucrats is bad for their futures, whether it be their civil liberties or the economic opportunities that they don't see today. This is a, this is an, a moment where Republicans could take advantage of that, but I think they have to offer an alternative that's compelling. And you're right, because everything that you talk about, if you go to the back of your book and uh, the, the rules for liberty, don't hurt people. Don't take people's stuff. Take responsibility. Work for it. Mind your own business and fight the power. Uh, to one extent or another, that's the antithesis of everything that we're seeing from this administration and from the, the Democrat uh, mantra going, you know, going forward and, and in recent past. Uh, it's not JFK's Democratic Party. So there's a very clear cut differential between what you're offering and what the Republicans should be offering and to what we're seeing the Democrats offer. I, th I think liberty is good politics, but more importantly, it's the basis of the American system. We're not, we're not just trying to win an election. We're trying to restore these values that, that made America the place of opportunity, the place where anybody could get ahead. Today, it's entrenched because there's so many powerful interests in Washington that, that, that are that barrier, that wall to this next generation actually getting something done for themselves, defined by their own goals. 
Well, and you, number five, mind your own business. Is that why, in general, you tend to stay away from the social ideas and stay more with the economic ideal? Well, I think what people are learning today is, is that our, our, our social values, the things that, that we teach our kids, the things that, that the way we define our personal relationship, my relationship with my wife, I think it's too important to outsource that to the political system, to 535 men and women that can't even balance the budget. Because once you give them that authority to define marriage, for instance, at the federal level, they can define it how they want to define it. Nancy Pelosi and Barack Obama can define it. I think we would rather see those, those very precious social institutions protected at the local level, protected at the family level, protected by institutions like churches where it belongs. Well, you're, so you're saying uh, you know, state, state by state uh, and, and federalism as opposed to a, a national uh, policy, but ultimately it, you know, it comes to the courts. Um, and what worries me is you know, the base. We saw the base stay home to a great extent uh, in the McCain election with Obama, or in the Romney election with Obama. And unless you're out there talking about right to life and the sanctity of life and the traditional marriage uh, and more, uh, you're, you're not going to have the base come out. And I don't think that a Republican against someone like Hillary Clinton is going to be electable unless they carve out a clear cut difference on foreign policy, economic policy, health care policy, but also the social issues. Yeah, I, I think if you look at 2010 as that moment where we got a number of people, not just the Republican base, by the way, not just conservatives, but people that were looking for a difference between the two parties, it was primarily defined by economics. And I'm not saying that social values aren't important. I just think that we should expect from our political system to respect our liberty. And once we get far beyond that, uh, they tend to mess things up more than fix things. Yeah, I was going to just say, but that was a midterm election in, in 010. I just think that the presidential elections are, are different. Matt, you've talked in the past about holding people accountable. Even if things go, go the way that you want them to in 2014, how, how do you hold these politicians accountable, especially the people that you've supported? Yeah, it, I think it's, it's not always about electing the right people. And I think, I think we've made mistakes in the past, always looking for the next Ronald Reagan instead of understanding that account accountability starts from the bottom up, if we create a constituency of educated people who are willing to show up in elections, but also willing to show up the day after the election and hold our elected officials accountable, you can support people in Washington when they do the right thing, but you can also um, um, pull them back when they, when they abandon us. All right, so as the president and CEO of FreedomWorks, uh, we got uh, 20 seconds of what happens in November. Republicans take the Senate. Republicans take the Senate, Republicans gain in the House, and they're going to win if they run on the ideas of freedom. All right, uh, Matt Kibbe, uh, don't hurt people and don't take their stuff, a libertarian manifesto. That's the book, and uh, we welcome uh, you and thank you again for coming on. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, guys. All right, when we come back, it's going to be the uh, Molesburg panel, and Heather and I will welcome in uh, Ron Christie and Sally Pipes, so uh, don't miss it. All that coming up right here on the Steve Malzberg Show on Newsmax Television.